So far this hour, we've learned about how noise and pollution are hurting the southern resident killer whales, but the main challenge to their survival is a lack of food. You see, these orcas don't eat other marine mammals or sharks like other orcas do. They only eat fish, and their favorite food, Chinook salmon, are also declining. So the story of saving the orcas is really a story of saving salmon. First, we're going to go to the Skagit River, one of the most important rivers for salmon in the Puget Sound region. In the middle of the Skagit River, somewhere near Mount Vernon, there's a hut-looking structure floating on the brown water. It's a fish trap where each morning state wildlife technicians check to see what's been caught. Uh, we operate it from January through mid-July to count juvenile salmon as they're migrating towards the uh, Puget Sound. Clayton Kinsel is a biologist with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and his team is mostly counting chum salmon right now, some three to 4,000 each night. Southern resident killer whales do eat chum, but scientists believe their diet depends on Chinook salmon. And like killer whales, Chinook salmon runs are dwindling. This fish trap is helping scientists figure out how to stop that. It tells us how many fish are coming downstream to the Puget Sound. So it, it's a tool that we use to, to set fisheries, manage fisheries, um, to, to inform habitat restoration in the lower river. Habitat restoration, the two words you'll hear more than most when it comes to Chinook salmon recovery, especially here on the Skagit River, where dikes and levees have cut off side streams that are important for young salmon trying to grow bigger and stronger for their journey to the ocean. These are places where the river used to flow many years ago and are now cut off. As a result, those places are now inaccessible to juvenile salmon moving down the river. Corey Green is a federal scientist with NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Science Center. Instead of a well-manicured river with a road right next to it, he showed me what young salmon need to survive. As you look downstream, you can see a big pile of wood, um, and those areas provide safe um, places for salmon to rear. And then these uh, little spots right here, this little pond, that's another place where salmon can duck in. This land is what Green and other scientists call a freshwater floodplain. It's important for salmon, but it also makes for great agricultural land and scenic riverfront properties. The Skagit has lost more than 50% of its floodplains, and Chinook salmon runs are just 10% of what they once were. A pretty large wild population, the largest in Puget Sound. Um, nevertheless, uh, these you've got less habitat for rearing salmon um, to use as they're uh, bulking up. And as a consequence, they compete with each other. And so that lost habitat means lost production of adults down the line. It's on rivers like the Skagit where scientists and others are trying to figure out a balance so we can produce food for hungry humans and food for hungry whales. It's going to take uh, a long time to, f to feel the effects of recovery. And so there's some short-term solutions people can take, uh, and there's going to be longer-term ones. And if we want to have a population of salmon to feed those orcas, we need to think about the long-term as well as the short-term. And those long-term solutions really are about habitat. You just saw the importance of the habitat upriver, but the part of the Skagit River that empties into the sound called the estuary is also vital habitat for salmon. It's where salmon take even more time to grow up big enough to venture out to the ocean. The channels give safe habitat filled with food for growing Chinook. But areas like this have decreased by 80%. Right now, the area's carrying capacity is about 1.5 million Chinook, and scientists want to increase that by 60%. That will mean restoring hundreds of acres and protecting existing habitat like this. Right now, I'm the seventh generation you know, from my ancestors at the treaty uh, signing time. And I don't think they could ever imagine, you know, what things could have changed to uh, looking at the landscapes they are now. It's a societal experiment and we'll see if society's willing to change their change uh, behavior enough to do the work to protect the habitat, to restore enough habitat to achieve salmon recovery goals. There is so much habitat to restore for salmon that some estimate it could take 90 to 100 years. So some farmers are stepping up and taking the lead, and one of them is helping restore salmon habitat in the South Sound's most important river system. Jerseys are known as some of the best dairy cows, but they're also known for their personalities. Jerseys are very curious. If, if there's a gate open, it won't be just one, they'll all go. 
John Van Warrigan's granddad bought the farm in 1936. His father describes the nearby creek decades ago as full of salmon. I'd like to bring it back to that. The idea was with, with doing this project was to make it so my grandkids and my grandkids' kids would be able to see that very thing. So the organic dairy with the curious cows is now the site of one of King County's latest salmon habitat restoration projects. Crews excavated this side channel of Boise Creek, one of the most important habitats for Wild Spring Chinook. Boise Creek is the only stream in King County that provides habitat for spring run Chinook, which is one of the most rare runs of salmon in Puget Sound. So we are very keen on restoring and enhancing the habitat in this stream in particular so we don't lose that fish run to extinction. Josh Kahn says Boise Creek was channeled decades ago for agriculture and the water often moved too fast to allow young fish the time to grow properly. And if there were high flows, they could get flushed out into the White River way before they were old enough to survive their migration out to Puget Sound. So having them stay in this stream system for as long as possible was really helpful to them in terms of maximizing their potential to survive. It's why projects like this are focusing on partnerships with farms and private landowners to restore hundreds of miles of river habitat in King County. We're trying to do everything we can to protect the salmon, protect the water, uh, protect the ground that we farm, and hopefully this would show that that's exactly what we're trying to do. Habitat is not the only challenge facing salmon recovery. Seals and sea lions eat the fish and compete with the orcas for food, which has some calling for the killing of the marine mammals to save the orcas. One by one, they were all found dead. More than a dozen sea lions shot, many in the head, washed up around Puget Sound last year, mostly in West Seattle. Sea lions and seals are often seen as adversaries of fishermen. A recent paper published by federal scientists shows that in Puget Sound, seals and sea lions eat twice as much Chinook salmon as southern resident killer whales and catch six times more Chinook salmon than recreational and commercial fishermen combined. Here at NOAA's Manchester Lab, scientists are learning more about another kind of fish that may unlock new information to save salmon. So we've been studying the survival of steelhead smolts as they migrate through Puget Sound and trying to figure out why they are dying as they make uh, the brief migration from the river mouths to the ocean. Barry Berejekian is a supervisory research fisheries biologist with NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Science Center. They've injected acoustic transmitters in steelhead that are detected by hydrophones on the floor of Puget Sound. They've also put detectors on harbor seals to see how they interact with the steelhead. In some cases, they found the fish transmitters where harbor seals spend time on land, indicating they are eating the fish. But they noticed some years the seals ate more, and some years they ate less. And the scientists believe it's connected to abundance of what's called forage fish. And these other prey resources, such as herring and anchovies and um, other bottom fish, are much higher in fat and much more abundant. So we think that um, seals and other things that prey on steelhead and salmon would prefer to eat those if they were abundant and when they're abundant. At this lab, scientists believe seals and sea lions would prefer smaller forage fish, but those fish aren't always here. Berejekian says they've started to see a connection between warmer water and an increase in anchovies. And when there are more anchovies, less steelhead are eaten by seals and sea lions. Essentially what we're saying is that if, if we're right about this and that predation is greater on salmon and steelhead when other forage fish and other uh, fish abundance is low, then really what we're talking about is restoration of the Puget Sound ecosystem to support these other prey species. While scientists are studying the problem of predators and habitat loss, hatcheries are producing more Chinook salmon to try to make up what's been lost. Governor Inslee has included $12 million in his operating budget to increase the amount of Chinook salmon produced at state hatcheries, but simply raising more fish is not enough. Hatcheries are having to change the way they operate to make sure more fish survive and make it to the whales.
It may look like a water park amusement ride for salmon, but this is the way hatchery Chinook are marked for identification when they return to Puget Sound as adults. Their adipose fin is clipped, and 200,000 of them will also be injected with identification tags. To solve the salmon problem is the same problem as trying to solve the orca problem. It's it's all interwoven. Uh, it's not just one piece is going to fix this big, huge problem that we have. Laylup Salmon Hatchery Assistant Manager Jesse Rood and his colleagues are working to improve the health and survival of the fish they release. Instead of releasing them all at one time, which is standard protocol, they're now experimenting with three release dates by changing water temperatures and how much the fish are fed. So we got three different programs early, normal, and late. And the earlies are going to be released here in a couple of weeks. The normal group will be released in June, and the late group will be released in August. Governor Inslee has included $12 million in his budget for increased hatchery fish production. And by the rate that they grow in the hatchery and when they're released, that can affect how many come back and how big they are. Like they might stay in the ocean an extra year and uh, come back as a larger adult. And that's what we're trying to come up with. But studies have shown that hatchery fish can have a negative impact on wild fish if special precautions aren't taken. Making sure we're not just dumping fish into a system with a bunch of wild fish um, and they're both competing for food and just making sure that we're not outplaying anything. And if we are, if we are having an effect, what exactly are our effects and are they adverse effects or is the effect not really creating any major issues? Trevor Jennison manages one of the state hatcheries, producing all that extra Chinook to help feed the southern resident killer whales. The fish that come back, it's it, they're 80% hatchery fish, right? It's just the way it is. And uh, if we don't rear hatchery fish well um, and effectively, then you know we're 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 not doing a service uh, to to the whales, to the fishermen. Or anything and and at the same time what well, we ultimately want to get to the point where we have wild fish. Michael Schmidt is deputy director of Long Live the Kings, a group that's studying why threatened fish like salmon and steelhead aren't making it out of Puget Sound to the open ocean where they grow to adulthood. Salmon are the lifeblood of Layla and that's who we are. So it's very important to each and every tribal member out here because we are the people of the salmon. Some argue, though, that even if we produce more fish in hatcheries, it won't make much of a difference until we take down barriers like dams that prevent fish from migrating up and down rivers. And one of the most controversial set of dams is on the lower Snake River. Those four dams are blamed for reducing salmon numbers on the Snake and Columbia River systems. They slow water, which increases temperatures and makes young salmon more susceptible to predators. Critics say the dams are losing money and don't produce enough power to make them worth it. But the river system is used by wheat farmers to transport grain, and lawmakers in those areas have argued the dams should stay in place. Governor Jay Inslee has signed a bill that provides $750,000 to study how to help impacted communities if the Snake River dams are breached. Both sides are critical of spending more money on studying the dams, but those who want to keep them say the decision is a federal one and the state is just wasting its money. Those who want to remove the dams say there have been enough studies and no more are needed. While the Snake River dams have received the most attention, they are not the only dams that hurt salmon. In fact, right here in the Puget Sound area, there are several hundred miles of habitat cut off to fish because of dams. But two of them recently got a lot of funding to make some big changes. My dad was a commercial fisherman who ended up owning a fish processing plant up in Blaine. For Bellingham Mayor Kelly Linville, this dam is personal. It cuts off salmon habitat at the middle fork of the Nooksack River. So when the fish come up, they get to the dam and they can't swim over the dam, right? So they have to stop. April McEwen is the project manager for American Rivers, helping to spearhead work to remove the dam while still maintain some diversion for Bellingham's water supply. It'll open up 16 miles of historic habitat for salmon in clean, cold water flowing from Mount Baker. So it's going to be smart infrastructure that allows the water diversion to be maintained while we remove the dam. So we're going to then remove the dam and restore access and fish passage, restore the channel 
uh, through the site and restore access to upstream habitat. Here on the White River, salmon are getting a different kind of solution. Downstream from the Mud Mountain Dam will soon be the largest fish trap in North America. So the existing fish trap was designed to pass up to 20,000 fish per year. We've used it to pass more than that, but it still isn't supporting the massive number of fish returns that we're seeing yearly. So the new fish passage has been designed to pass 1.25 million per year and up to 60,000 fish per day. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project manager Leah Honstein says it was designed by more than 150 engineers from five different organizations. So if we didn't have a trap here with our dam, we would have a loss of tens of miles to hundreds of miles of habitat. We would have fish runs that are much lower than they currently are, and they might actually go extinct. There may not be enough habitat for some of these fish. Fish biologist Fred Geffs explained how it works. The fish swim up a ladder and into the trap. Then a truck will move them upstream and release them above the dam, again in an area with pristine water perfect for salmon flowing off Mount Rainier. We are just one river basin of 14 that you'd find in the Puget Sound, but this is one of the most important basins. It's one of the largest. It has spring chinook salmon, which is one of the preferred um, kinds of salmon that orca eat. This project will cost $112 million, but that money is already secured. Back here on the Nooksack, though, funding is still unsure as the project waits for state money. And the state has said that this is a top priority project, so actions speak louder than words, and uh, we believe that the state will deliver on this. Critics of Governor Inslee's budget say it doesn't do enough for salmon habitat restoration, which they say could take 100 years if current funding levels aren't increased. Advocates for the project here on the Nooksack say it could increase salmon runs by 31 percent. It's a great opportunity to not let generations of children think that every river should be dammed. Up next, we'll show you how helping the southern resident orcas may start right in your own backyard.